The black Polish telephone on Stalin's desk started ringing. He quickly raised the receiver and hung it up again to restore silence. We found other work for him in the East, more suited to his talents and interests. So what do you think? Ever since the foreign ministry recalled me to Moscow, I have studiously avoided this question. Back when I was Comrade Litvinov's aide in England, I didn't mind fielding it. Those were good times, far from home. Maxime was a good boss. He and I once watched a Marx Brothers movie together. We laughed, we drank Smirnov. Sometimes I think that the foreign minister recalled me to Moscow precisely because Litvinov and I had got along so well. Every few years now, so everyone shifts to new jobs and nobody knows anybody anymore. It makes it hard to get into the rhythm in a job and it breaks up all loyalties. You don't know who you're talking to or how to tailor your answers to your interrogator's liking. The only constant in my book is the picture of Stalin on the wall. And now that picture was asking my opinion. Why did he want it from me? What possible interest could he have in my opinion on his coiffure? Yes, my father was a barber, and I've inherited some knowledge, but I am hardly expert. Stalin commands an army of photographers and portrait artists whose opinions vastly overmatch mine. Had someone in the office denounced me? Had word reached Stalin? Was it his way of catching me off my guard, of reading my reactions to him? His eyes seemed to dig into me, probably extracting material inside I didn't know was there. What was he finding? Was there a Trotskyist opinion on hairstyle? That Stalin had just ferreted out of me something about my aesthetic in these matters that would betray loyalties outside of him? What questions would follow? What songs do I like? Valentin Hama? Hmm, Ryut liked Hama. What does that say about my commitment to the five year plan? What was there to denounce? I said nothing. Not to co workers, not to my wife, nothing about my opinions. When Vera asked me how my work is, I said fine and tell her some amusing tales about safe trivia from the office. Who kissed whom? Who came in drunk? Who told the day's best or worst joke? When I ask her how her work is, she tells me all about the hospital and its discontents. And I smile. I work in the foreign ministry. There's nothing I can do about short supplies of blood or bandages or vaccines or whatever. My opinions are right, I don't. If Stalin looks, he'll see nothing. So why did his turning his high-powered perception of human weakness on me shake me so? Same reason I'm out here whispering this fucking story to a divot in the ground, that's why. How do you know what your opinion might coincide with? I don't know what everyone else in the world might have said. Things I've said probably would sound like things once said by Trotsky, or Ryutin, or Reichardt, or Kamenev, or Henry fucking Ford for that matter. There are only so many things to say. Words and ideas are finite. That's a problem of language, not of me. Of course, maybe this was all paranoid fancy. Another way to read the General Secretary's question was as a sincere request for information. His barber was new. Never mind why he was new, he was. Maybe Stalin wanted to gather a wide range of views about whether this was the right man for the job. Maybe everyone else he'd asked had shown the same fears as I had and stammered their way toward what they thought Stalin wanted to hear. I felt some sympathy for the Comrade Secretary. It must be hard for Stalin, perched at dawn at the top of an entire nation to know whether he's being flattered or bullshitted or mollified. It surely breeds mistrust and misunderstanding if he asked the janitor, excuse me, where's the bathroom? Would not the janitor quake in fear that this was some kind of test? 
and take perhaps way too long to help point comrades down to the place where he can empty his engorged bladder? Might this stammering uselessness not provoke the general secretary into thinking, perhaps he wants me to piss myself while he shilly shallies and stammers, after calling my with him? Besides this, whatever my answer, what would I say to Vera about it when I came home? Sure, don't, just don't say anything, right? Suppose my home is bad, and suppose that after I walked in the door and kissed Vera, I didn't mention Stalin's question. A question Stalin would expect me to mention to my wife because his asking me at all, anything, ought to be an event a good communist husband narrates to his good communist wife. My silence would indicate my distaste for his haircut, but saying something would be worse. I can lie to the world, but I can't lie for my beer. The instant I opened my mouth, she'd see that I hated Stalin's haircut, even if I told her it looked good. She'd tell everyone, make all sorts of comments, and potentially cook us both. I had visions of her in Lubyanka, the things they do, all because I couldn't shut up when she asked how my day was. I often think this would happen anyway with Vera's big mouth, but if I were to contribute to it, to her pain, I couldn't bear it. For me, it's just her and the picture on the wall. Those are my constants. All else are bad things. Another possibility. The general secretary knew his haircut in that of him. He wanted to see who would tell him the truth and who would fall. Maybe Stalin told his barber to do it deliberately, or maybe he was just taking advantage of a botched job. If so, I had to admire Stalin's subtlety of mind. There are only so many ways to answer a complex question of policy so you can appear to be on any and all sides of it. The best of us in the ministry hold this capability and, to be honest, is something we share in common with our counterparts in Western bureaucracies, both in government and in business. The ones who fail in those capacities vanish, just as species that fail to adapt to the necessities of the material world perish. Eventually, Stalin will, if he continues, winnow the party down to those who can believe in anything and everything. But I reminded myself to curb my enthusiasm about this possible interpretation of Stalin's query. It had to be borne in mind that one of the possibilities here, if the barber had tried but failed to deliver a suitable haircut, meant that if I told Stalin the truth, the barber was destined for punishment of some sort. I didn't want that on my conscience. I mean, maybe he'd get off with just publicly denouncing himself, but who, who knew? It's taken me a long time to say all this, I know. But while I stood in that office, and shivered from a draft that hit me square on the back, and Stalin marched, searched my face for an answer to that question. I processed every one of these thoughts, and hundreds more linked to them through my brain as I tried to settle on exactly the right response. Calculations of potential for losing and gaining sped through my mind. I tried to grab the thoughts as they flew past, fumbling at them, snatching. Was I sweating? Had I fidgeted for a moment? How much time had actually passed since Stalin's question? Two seconds? Three? How much longer could I wait odds before he'd know I was hesitating and therefore didn't like the haircut? How long? would it take to formulate the proper language for the sentence once I settled on the proper response.